Good morning. Is that on? Yes. All right. Good. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee on this gorgeous preview to spring day. My name is Beth Monholland, and I am honored to serve as your worship associate today and to welcome you fully into this space. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies here. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit here. We welcome all that you bring with you today and all that your heart longs to set down. We extend a special welcome to any guests among us. Guests are welcome to fill out a welcome card located in the pew rack in front of you and drop it in the offering plate later in the service. Guests may also pick up a welcome packet at the rear of the sanctuary where you will also find braille hymnals and hearing assist devices. And of note, there is a fragrance free area on the front right side in the first few pews. If you are a visiting family today, including children and youth, after the seminarian's ritual noted in your order of service, please join the children's recessional and head across the hall to the common room. There, you will be greeted by someone who will orient you to religious education. Immediately following the service, everyone is invited for coffee and conversation in the common room. My name again is Beth, and you're welcome to talk with me at the guest table there. As a way to engage at First Church, I invite you to explore the announcements in search for the numerous opportunities available here. In particular, let me draw your attention to just a few. Our forum speaker this morning at 1010 is David Reimer, Senior Fellow with Community Advocates Public Policy Institute. The forum is titled, Why the U.S. Needs a New Deal 3.0. Please join the pledge team's weaving project today during coffee hour as we continue to raise awareness of our pledge drive and our desire to become a pledge sustained congregation. The chronologically gifted group will be meeting for its February potluck today at 12:30 in Max Auto Hall. No dish to share, no problem, just come anyway. A celebratory suffragette luncheon is scheduled for Saturday, March 14th from 11 to 2 and will feature history, poetry, music, luscious food, and perhaps even some attendees dressed as suffragists. There's a sign up during coffee hour. Please find details on these and more events in the announcements insert. It's now my pleasure to welcome our pulpit guest, the Reverend Dr. William Sinkford, who currently serves as the Senior Minister of First Unitarian Church of Portland, Oregon. Reverend Sinkford is probably best known for his service as President of the Unitarian Universalist Association from 2001 to 2009. His tenure was marked by strong public witness for social justice and support for marginalized communities. He earned his BA from Harvard in 1968 and holds honorary doctorates from Tufts University and Meadville Lombard Theological School. Reverend Sinkford was the first African American to lead any traditionally white denomination and was named one of the 10 most influential black religious leaders in the US in both 2005 and 2006. He and his wife Maria have four adult children and one grandchild. Join me in wel welcoming Reverend Sinkford to First Church. <laughs> Finally, so that we may all stay fully present with each other today, please silence any electronic devices for the remainder of the service. Once again, I welcome you to First Church by inviting you to join me in the unison reading of our mission, which is printed in your order of service. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. And now I'd like to welcome Dylan Duffy and Lucy Fawns to come forward and light our chalice this morning. Words inspired by the Reverend Sarah York. We receive fragments of holiness, glimpses of eternity, brief moments of wholeness. Let us gather them up for the precious gifts that they are, 
And as we pause here on the cutting edge of our lives, let us prepare ourselves to welcome hope into our hearts, joy into our spirits, and love into our lives. Come now and let us worship together. Will you rise now in body or in spirit and join in our first hymn, number 1007, There's a River Flowing in My Soul. In our living tradition of Unitarian mm. Universalism, ministers arise from, are formed in, and are called out of our congregations. As each one of us weaves our own individual thread into this church, so too our congregation is one of the threads of the living tapestry of our Unitarian Universalist tradition. From our lineage of ministers, including Dr. Bailey and John Cyrus and Drew Kennedy and Craig Schwallenberg and Dina McFeeters and myself, as well as all who come after us, arise our living tradition. Our congregation has also had a number of ministers who have heard their calling in our church. And today we're recognizing three of our members who are in the middle of their formation process. The process from lay leader to minister is a long and involved one. And Kimberly Tom Jack Carlson, who is nearing the culmination of her process, is going to share some of those steps with you all. As Jennifer said, the story I have for you today is a long story. <laughs> But alas, I'm not the featured speaker today, so I will use my storytelling magic to make it as short as possible. Here are the Cliff Notes version of ministerial formation. Once upon a time, <laughs> something called to those of us who have chosen ministry, a message we received from the nucleus of our souls telling us that we needed to try this thing. Perhaps it was the sacred responsibility to serve people, the need to speak truth and create ritual, something, something called to each of us to believe that ministry was our path in life. So we filled out that application to seminary, which requires recommendations from ministers and churches, plus 
a comprehensive essay of all significant life-shaping events and the meaning that you have derived from your existence so far. <laughs> really. <laughs> This soul delving continues once you're in seminary. You're there for a minimum of three years well, you were where you will learn and write so many words about things. This is the short list. Theology, religious history, sacred scriptures, and preaching. Plus, you will complete a chaplaincy training and an internship in a church so that you may graduate with a degree in divinity. <laughs> divinity, though, is not enough. To be a fellowship to you minister, you also must pass the evaluation of the ministerial fellowship committee. And then finally, all UU clergy have also been ordained by a Unitarian Universalist congregation to earn the title of reverend, a sacred duty that only a congregation can bestow on a minister in our faith. So we have three members of our congregation who are currently in seminary, and they are at various stages in this process. If you would like to talk to any one of these members after the service to learn more about their formation process or seminary or what it's been like, you can find them near the membership table. These seminarians in process of ministerial formation have been called to their service to our living tradition from among you. So will Omega Burkhart and Denise Cauley and Monica Kling now please come up to the chancel. Our seminarians are each going to share a little bit with you about how this congregation influenced their call to the ministry, just one of the many ways in which this church changes the world. Denise, will you start us off? This congregation is where I first heard messages of LGBTQ welcoming, pro-choice support, and love for our earth. The first place I saw young adults and women in the pulpit. My art has been on these walls. This church let me weave together justice, creativity, and feminine spirituality. And those were really integral in shaping my theology of beauty and inspiring me to queer our faith. Black filmmaker, writer, and professor Tony Kade Bambara says, the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. Thank you for exposing me to irresistible ministry. Hello all, I'm Monica Kling Garcia. My call to ministry was something I had felt in my childhood as a Catholic, but was long forgotten by the time that I had entered the doors of this church. During my time here as a member, this community lovingly gave me opportunities to explore this faith. From oofta brunches to circle suppers, from leading RE classes to preaching my very first sermon, this church brought me back into a faith community and showed me that my call was welcome here. First Church saw the light of my ministry and gave it the home of a chalice. Thank you all. The involved congregant to lay leader to seminarian path works, dear people. <laughs> I became a Unitarian Universalist in this sacred space, guided by many of my gentle friends here, and also guided by the gentle light coming through those stained glass windows. After a session of Harvest the Power came Midwest Leadership School, which in turn led to committees and board positions, both here and regionally. And when my call to ministry turned from a quiet yet insistent tap to a full-fledged symphonious hymn, I was able to embrace my song, thanks to the love and dedication from you all. This I experienced here, I continue to experience here as a gift from you and the leadership of this congregation. 
And for that, I am deeply grateful and humbled to carry the light that was first ignited in me here out into the world. Thank you. Uh, congregation, the seminarians would like to receive your blessing as they carry that light out into the world. So will you please rise in either body or spirit and join in the responsive reading that is printed in your orders of service. I'll be on mic for all of it. But you're the congregation. <laughs> Just to be clear. In this moment, intersecting past and future. We They are part of our unit tradition. We have been called from among us and are headed out beyond us, carrying our highest ideals with you. In our formation process, making meaning of life's joys and tragedies, carrying love to people who need it, and sharing a vision of the beloved community we seek your blessing on our journey. We give you our blessing in your calling to bless the world. You take us forward with you, and your presence will stay with us from your time as one of us. Go forth with our blessing in your formation, your studies, your internship, and your journey towards ordination and fellowship. Go forth with our blessing and our love. And seminarians, we have a little gift to you from the congregation. This is the light of this particular First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's chalice, our branded pin. So you can have us with you wherever you go. <laughs> congregation, let's now bless our seminarians with a round of applause. We now turn inward for words of prayer, for silence, and for the singing of Spirit of Life. Will you pray with me now? Spirit of Life and of Love, known by many names and no name, great mystery at the heart of things, dear God. We gather, we gather in community, bringing all the hurts and the hopes of our lives, all the joys that lift us up, and all the struggles that press us down. We gather at this time and in this place to claim a vision for beloved community, a vision that helps us hold fast to our hopes, even when hope is hard to find. Here and now, we renew connection, connection to ourselves and to the integrity for which we hope and toward which we aspire. We renew connection to the love that holds us all and that holds all that we love. Now, in this hour, we open our hearts, even our hearts that are broken and bruised, trusting that the spirit of life will move within us. We open our hearts, even our hearts that are fearful and may want to close, trusting that the spirit of life and of love will move among us. May we discover that there is more courage in us than fear when we join together. 
And may we remain naive enough to speak words of love and of hope and of joy and mean them for each of us and for all of us. May that be so. And amen. Our reading this morning is by the Reverend Victoria Safford. It's entitled, In the Struggle, Singing, Shining. Victoria writes, I once saw a little girl dressed in a fabulous outfit. She was in preschool, and her clothes were matched only by the radiance with which she wore them. A dress tide-eyed in bright colors, hot pink, bright orange, and electric yellow, with socks to match, pink suede sandals, and on her knee, as she revealed to me demurely by lifting the hem of her skirt, a band-aid in the brightest bright blue. We were out of purple ones, she explained with mild regret. The child was shining shining. I admired her dress and her joie de vivre and said, well, and she said, well, I wanted to wear my favorite outfit because we're having church today. And, in case I had somehow failed to notice, this is my favorite outfit, she said. <laughs> she gave her dress a little flip. She straightened her short legs so the sandals stuck straight out. She ratcheted up those fiery socks and looked me in the eye. I thanked her humbly for her example, and wholeheartedly I meant it. Later, in the afterglow of her costume and her gladness, I thought about that girl. There are children all over the world, and some adults scattered here and there, who unfailingly will punctuate their lives and their days with sacred celebration and with rituals that signify joy, no matter what they have or don't to work with, and no matter what fury the world outside is howling. They will savor life and breath and all their days, no matter what is dealt them. It's the only way some people know how to live, with gladness and cacophonous color. <laughs> These are people who pray without ceasing, awake and aware, chanting if they're old enough, this is the life I would risk anything to save. Gather yourselves, say the Hopi elders, see who is in the water with you and celebrate. All that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. Victoria goes on, there are things in this life that are so beautiful, so lovely, so simple, extraordinary, ordinary blessings that the only response sometimes is thankfulness, the kind of thankfulness that clamors for loud colors on a Sunday morning. Choose your clothing with defiance, with attitude, with joie de, joie de vivre, and with intention. Every action is a sacrament, 
every move a symbol, every color a song, this is the day we'd risk anything to save. Thank you, Van. Unitarian Universalist minister Mark Harris tells of his father complaining about Unitarian Universalism, your religion has no fantasy. This meant to him, Mark goes on, that we are challenged, we liberal religious folks, to put laughter, joy, and full-bodied experiences into our worship services. But it's also a reminder that a deeper and quieter experience, those experiences of sorrow, love, grief, contrition, and connection must also be evoked so that we may sit with them all and become whole in our sacred space. Become whole in our sacred space. I am extremely glad to be with you this morning. So thankful that Jennifer was willing to say yes when we spoke of doing a pulpit exchange this year. You see, I wanted my congregation to have the chance to hear your very fine minister. And I look forward, yes, you can applaud for Jennifer, amen. And I look forward to returning to Milwaukee. So most of you probably don't remember my last visit here. It was about a dozen years ago. I was UUA president then. And I preached, I preached the good news of Unitarian Universalism that day. I spoke of our faith that our differences need not divide us, that they can be blessings and not curses. I preached of our belief that each and every one of us is worthy, that each of us is gifted, that each of you is a gift, that you are all, each and every one of you, already lovable and already loved. I preach that love will, in the end, prove stronger than fear, and I talked of our faith that love will, in the end, win. It was a good sermon. <laughs> and it's still a good sermon, but today, I want to go a bit deeper because unless you have been asleep, you know that the challenges have gotten tougher out there since I was last here. It's gotten harder to hold the hope that I promised back then. And so we need to go deeper to understand where our tradition has grown strong and to understand where it needs to grow stronger. Unitarian Universalism. So the Universalists, well, their reason for being was rejection of that gloomy Calvinist doctrine that a few of us would be saved, but that most of us were headed in the other direction. It was a grim theology. Sinners in the hands of an angry God was its most famous sermon. The Unitarians, from the very beginning as well, rejected a theology based on exclusion. No saved and damned for them, no sheep and goats for William Ellery Channing, the father of our faith. That's part of the origin story of Unitarianism, too. But it's only part of the story. It was not the whole story for the Unitarians. Because as much as Unitarianism was a rejection of that gloomy Calvinist view, it was also a reaction to the emotional religious awakening that was sweeping the United States when Unitarianism was born. It was called the Second Great Awakening. There had been a First Great Awakening, Great Awakening before. This was a time when there were joyous camp meetings out in the trees with emotional preaching and great moving music. These were revivals that offered not a rational search for truth, they offered conversion. They called for repentance. People were overcome when they were saved. The Second Great Awakening transformed the religious landscape of this nation. When it began, only two in 10 citizens, all white citizens, of course, identified with a religion. When it ended in the mid 19th century, eight in 10 did. How could we forget that? How could we not mention that 
Why isn't that a part of the story we tell about our faith? Hmm. When William Ellery Channing was creating a Unitarian faith as a religion of reason, he was drawing a contrast with those joyful and out of control camp meetings that were going on at the very same time. Those camp meetings were not for the propertied and privileged Unitarians in their formal churches. The result, unfortunately, is that the loving God that, that Channing preached and human perfectibility, which was his message, became a cold and rational faith. There was satisfaction in it, but there wasn't much joy. Mark Harris writes that we have struggled for membership growth ever since, <laughs> often making our yearning and our search and intellectual exercise in rational truth-seeking, while we've neglected community building, and, and I might add, while we've neglected the life of the Spirit. So, so that's part of our history, part of how we got to be the religious people that we are. There's a reason that we yearn for wholeness in our sacred spaces. My first point is that we need to remember all of our origins and all of our story. But that does not tell us how we need to move today and what tools we need to shape a community worthy of being called beloved, a world in which we can find hope even in these complicated days. So given who we are, what tools do we need? And what tools should be off the table? The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Do any of you remember Audrey Lord? Few, hand, few hands, maybe? Oh, quite a few. That's good. She was author, poet, activist, prophet. And that's one of her most famous quotes. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Have any of you heard that phrase used in progressive circles in which you move? I see if, have any of you used that phrase? Aha, I see, I see. I've used it, I have to confess. It went something like this. No, no, we need collaborative leadership. Hierarchy is part of the master's tools. We need to stay away from that. And the master's tools can never be used to dismantle the master's house, right? The year was 1979, and Lord had agreed to be one of the speakers at an NYU-sponsored conference on feminism, a hot topic in the academy back then. Still needs to be. But when she spoke, she offered a biting critique of the conference. I stand here as a black lesbian feminist, she said, having been invited to comment on the only panel at this conference where the input of black feminists and lesbians is even represented. What this says about the vision of this conference is sad in a country where racism, sexism, and homophobia are inseparably tied. And what does it mean when the two black women who did present here were literally found at the last hour? What does it mean when the tools of a racist patriarchy are used to examine the fruits of that same patriarchy? As long as we use the master's tools, only the most narrow parameters of change are possible. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Wow. Her words became transformative. They still are for many of us because we know almost instantly and intuitively what they mean and know somehow that they ring true or at least we think we do. Nothing can be solved by becoming the thing we want to dismantle, right? If we move into the master's house and use the tools of control the master used, we've only changed the master. We haven't changed the control or the violence or the oppression, right? Can I have an amen to that? I wonder, though, if Audre Lorde's words have come to be misused or, or at least incompletely understood. Michael White, one of the co-founders of the Occupy movement, describes Lorde's phrase as the atomic bomb of discussion enders. <laughs> Some of you know what I mean. 
It can be applied to absolutely everything from language to violence to art. And if the master's tools cannot be used, then in an age when capitalism claims ownership over everything, only resignation is possible. We should just throw up our hands and give up, I guess. Or should we? What tools can we use? Let me give you an example. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution, written to free the enslaved population of the US, was later appropriated and used to enshrine corporations as people, leading in our day to the Citizens United decision and so much that we progressives decry. Master's tool if there ever was one, right? Does that mean we should abandon the 14th Amendment? Just give it over to the corporate lobbyists? Let it go? Or should our work be to reclaim that tool as our own and question whether it was ever really implemented as it was intended? The tool of the masters that Audre Lorde focused on most was exclusion. It was the exclusion of categories of real lived human experience that she critiqued most effectively. For women, she wrote, the need and desire to nurture each other is not pathological, it is redemptive. Interdependency is the way to a freedom which allows the individual to be, not in order to be used, but in order to be creative, in order to be creative. It was the exclusion of all those human truths that point toward interconnection and compassion that was the ultimate master's tool. Exclusion, leaving us with only competition and scarcity, just win, lose. No space for the valuing of difference. Is it possible, just possible, that our real lived experience, our varied and particular real lived experience can become the source of our power? Is it possible that our differences can become the incubator of compassion, not the source of fear or hatred, but compassion? Is it possible? just possible that despair is not our final destination. Gather yourselves, say the Hopi elders, see who is in the water with you and celebrate, and cele rejoice. The original Christian communities told their members that if you have two coats, give one to someone in need. Exclusion says, you keep that extra coat. You can't spare a coat. You can never have too many coats and you need every coat that you can acquire. It's the old story of who is in and who is out. It's the sheep and the goats all over again, the privileged and the expendable, the worthy and the worthless. It is a question at heart of who we are and of who we choose to be. Are we, do we want to be merely homo economicus the capitalist ideal interested only in acquiring more and more and more for ourselves, never satisfied as long as one of our neighbors seems to have more or bigger or better than we have. Is that who we want to be? Is that how we want to live? Acquiring and hoarding what we acquire? Is that where our hope lies? The study of our close cousins in the primate world tells us we have a choice. Primatologist Sarah Brosnan offered two apes in adjacent cages, and I will just note here that they were in cages, pieces of carrot as rewards for performing a simple task. And both apes were delighted to perform the task over and over again, and they loved the carrots. Occasionally, however, she would give one of them a grape, the favorite reward, desired much more than just a carrot. And when one received a grape, the other would refuse to perform the task or even throw the carrot back at the researcher. That was the expected result. Homo, or in this case, primate, primate econo economicus. Competitive, greedy. What they did not expect was that the grape recipient the ape who got the grape might be upset as well. 
And what they discovered is that the grape recipient would often refuse the grape unless their partner in the cage next door also got a grape. Fairness, equity, compassion, relationship, at least to our eyes outside. Apes, chimpanzees, and small children. This experiment has been done with all three. And they all usually prefer rewards to be equal, complain when rewards are unequal, demonstrate what we would call compassion, feeling with and for the other, rather than just greed. Now, I do not want to pretend that this is all simple, that we just have to choose hope, choose collaboration, choose compassion, choose love. We are all too familiar with the ways of the world and how they live within us and not just around us. But there is, but, but there is a very, and there's a very different conversation needed with and about those who are truly in need, the hungry and the houseless. But it is critical, it seems to me, that we remember that we do have choices. They may not be simple, they may not be easy, but they are choices. Rejoice. You can choose. That is what those camp meetings were about, a choice about how to live. Reverend Deanna Vandeveer writes, to our dominant culture framed by a scarcity narrative, I offer this truth. When we see that our days are replete with abundance, we become less afraid. When we are less afraid, we connect more. And the more connection we see in our lives, the more abundance we notice. It becomes a self-sustaining prophecy. Now, this is not easy. Welcoming the rich diversity of human experience, making sure that those who are on the margins are welcomed in and into leadership, trusting the miracle that happens when we actually listen and learn from one another, it's not easy stuff. Deanna goes on, Sometimes the abundance will fill us up, and sometimes the abundance will just wear us out. It is, however, and without doubt, a more loving way to move through the world than a life lived out of scarcity. The master's tools of divisiveness, of pitting some of us against others of us, the master's tools require life to be grim, always a competition. They require us to be on guard. It's win-lose all the way. And being on guard makes it almost impossible to feel joy. Oh, we may feel some satisfaction at a victory or two along the way when we've defeated someone else, but I believe real joy is harder to come by. Perhaps the most radical thing I have to say to you today is that joy, delight in each other, awe at the diversity of the complex persons with whom we journey and the wonder of the world we have received Joy may be the most radical tool in our toolbox. From a conversation between Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama in a book called The Book of Joy, words of the Archbishop, hope is the antidote to despair. Hope is nurtured by relationship, by community. Despair turns us inward. Hope sends us into the arms of others. Hope sends us into the arms of others. Here's the hard part and the hope. The master's tools are in us, in all of us. That's the hard part. But there is more in us than just that. That is the hope. There is the impulse to fairness, the instinct for compassion, and the capacity for joy. All of those are in us as well. And it's a choice. We can become more gentle and more compassionate, brighter, more powerful, less fearful. It's a choice. Hope is a choice. It is a life choice. The life we will risk anything for. The only life we have. 
rejoice. very full. <laughs> Thank you. Every week, we have the opportunity to practice our values through sharing our resources. Our pledges are at the core of our practice of generosity. In addition, the church shares half of all the non-pledge cash in our offering plate with a community organization. In this way, we commit our resources in line with our belief that this congregation is interdependent with the world beyond these walls. Today, we share the plate with Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism. May the practice of giving bring us joy. The offering will now be gratefully received. How do you follow that? <laughs> Please join now in our responsive reading. It's printed in your order of service. It's entitled, We Must Shine by Christiane de la Huerta. We must shine. We must shine now. This is the goal toward which we stretch, step by step, in our own time, at our own pace. As our beauty unfolds and our hearts open, we become gentler and more compassionate yet brighter, more empowered, and fearless. We have been holding on, holding back, playing small, hiding our light under a bushel. Enough of that. It is time to let go. We are needed now, all of us, all of us together. All those who feel a calling to be who we are to the fullest, to make a difference, to give it all we got. Let's join now in singing our final hymn, number 1017, Building a New Way. <laughs> 